Those of you who are parents, do you remember that stage of life where your children, no matter what you would say, responded with, why, about a thousand times a day? You would answer the question, and invariably, why? And it would go on and on. And finally, you, as a parent, become, would become so frustrated that even though you knew it was not the proper response, you would say, and I want you to finish the statement, because I... That's right. Not always the best answer, is it? But sometimes you don't know what to do. Uh, our Matt was, uh, was probably an expert at that. The reality is it's difficult. It's difficult to win with a child whether he's asking the questions or you're asking the question. Some of you probably heard this story, but it's one of my favorites, and I think it just fits so well with introducing a lesson on questions. Matt was about uh, four years old, I think, at this time, and we had had dinner one evening, and we'd all finished up, and I don't remember what the item was, but there was some item on his plate. He had not eaten any of that, and so I thought, well, this would be a good teachable moment, and I said, son, you know, we, we're thankful for all of our blessings, and we need to eat our food. Mama's worked hard. And he said, no, I'm not going to do it. I said, well, let's talk about that a little bit. And so we did for about 15, 20 minutes. Pam had already cleaned up everything that was there on the table. Jason had been in his high chair. She'd cleaned him up, put all the dishes up, and we're sitting there just going back and forth, back and forth. My blood pressure is rising. I'm getting frustrated. And finally, I turned to him and I said, Matt, do you know what the word stubborn means? Never ask a child a question. Because <laughs> he said, yes, Dad, it means obstinate. <laughs> I lost. <laughs> that same boy, as he became an adult, was really good in IT work. And so I know it surprises you, but from time to time, I would have a computer question. And so I would call Matt and say, hey, son, what about this? And he would always respond by saying, well, Dad, I could explain it to you, but you won't understand it. And I'd say, you're right, but you didn't have to say that. And then he'd tell me what the answer was. Sometimes it's just difficult to win with a child asking questions or when you're asking him questions. But questions are one of the, one of the best ways to learn, whether it is a teacher asking questions or if the teacher gives you an opportunity, a student asking questions. Jesus often used questions in his conversation. Uh, while I was thinking about this lesson, I did a Google search on questions Jesus asked. And I know this is right because it's on the interweb. So uh, it said, uh, let's see, you Google questions Jesus asked, Zondervan produced a study sheet listing 173 questions that Jesus asked. Questions like, is it uh, lawful to do good on the Sabbath? Questions like, here we are, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? From Luke chapter 6, verse 31. Or, why do you see the speck that is in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how about this one? Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say to you? Jesus saw the value of questions. And so tonight, I want us, as we study, to look at three very important questions that we see in the Bible. The first comes from Genesis chapter 50. If you want to open your Bibles there, we'll be looking for a moment at this story of Joseph and his brothers. And as you know and remember from your study, uh, it was an amazing, it is an amazing story. It's a lengthy section of the book of Genesis as Joseph and his brothers are in essence going at war with one another as brothers sometimes do. In this particular instance, however, it was all of Joseph's brothers against him. You'll remember that Joseph had a couple of dreams that he, he shared with his brothers and his father where the interpretation he gave was that they were going to bow down to him. And, of course, that just infuriated them. Uh, 
who do you think you are, little boy, telling us that we're going to bow down to you? And so they became so frustrated. Uh, Joseph's dad loved him more than he did the brothers, and evidence of that was that coat of many colors that his father gave to him. So when Joseph's brothers were out working in the field, Joseph was at home with dad. That in and of itself probably angered them, even though he was younger. And so finally dad sent him to check on them and uh, when they saw him coming from a distance, you're familiar with the story, they ended up selling him into slavery. Time passes. I don't know how they dealt with their dad over that long period of time. We do know from Scripture that they took that coat of many colors and they killed an animal and put some blood on it and said, look what we found, of course, implying to the father that he was dead. And so here's Joseph's father for a long time grieving the death of his son. Eventually, Joseph was sold into slavery through the providence of God became the second in command of all of Egypt. And when God had sent a great famine into the land in Egypt, Joseph, in the wisdom God had gave him, helped the people of Egypt prepare for that famine. The famine came and was horrendous. Eventually, Joseph's brothers come to Egypt to get some food because they are about to starve. And lo and behold, here they are bowing before Joseph, who is second in command of all of Egypt. In my opinion, Joseph toys with them a little bit. He sends them back home and uh, accuses them of stealing some things. And he asks them about, is there anyone else in your family? And they say, well, we have one more brother. We had another, but he no longer is. That was an interesting way of saying it, wasn't it? They thought he was dead. And here they were, bowing before him. They didn't recognize him. It had been so long since they'd seen him, and they certainly did not expect him to be the one who was in charge, giving them food. So eventually, in the process of time, Joseph revealed himself to his brothers. He instructs them to go back and get their dad and bring the whole family to Egypt, which they do. And that brings us to about the 50th chapter of Genesis. And Joseph is still having conversations with them. Their father has now died, and they are afraid now that their father has died that he's going to exact revenge upon them. That brings us to verse 19 of Genesis chapter 50. Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. For am I in the place of God? Wow, what a question. What happens in life when we assume the place of God? Can you imagine you think things are messed up now? Can you imagine how our world would be if you were God or if I was God. When we go about the process of placing ourselves in God's place, then we have made one of the worst decisions that we could possibly make. Because God, in His great love and mercy and grace, is postponing the punishment that our sin deserves. The Bible teaches us that God is not slack concerning His promise. That means God hasn't forgotten what He's promised. He's not slack, as some men count slackness. He's not just Forgot like some people forget. God is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness. But he's long-suffering toward us. The best way I know to describe, uh, define that word long-suffering, which we often refer to as patience, is God 
suffers long with us. He suffers really, 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 really long. Why would he do that? The verse goes on to answer that. Not willing that any should perish. God does not want a single one of us to spend an eternity separated from him. And so in his love and mercy and grace, he sent Jesus into the world to pay the penalty for our sin. The Bible tells us that God made him who knew no sin. That's Jesus. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Can you imagine your spiritual condition now if you were in the place of God? If you'd totally rejected God and said, okay, I'm the one in charge. Now, can you imagine how the world would look? Can you imagine the spiritual condition that you would be in? Joseph asked his brothers, am I in the place of God? And of course, the answer is, no, Joseph knew that. He wanted his brothers to understand, understand that because there is only one God. He's the God that's spoken about in Genesis chapter 1 where the Bible says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. He is the God who suffers long with us as we talked about a moment from 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 5. He is the God who sacrificed his son for you and me. What did those brothers deserve? Well, we could spend a long time talking about that, couldn't we? They had lied to their father over and over again. They had mistreated their brother. On and on and on the list could go. But Joseph said, listen, I'm not God. I'm not going to give you what you deserve. I'm going to give you what you need. And folks, that's who God is. Now there's coming a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. And he's promised us that. He's given us assurance of that and they raised him from the dead. There's going to come a day when God will judge the world. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, to Timothy said, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead. There will come a day when God's patience ends. There will come a day when God in essence says, I've given you year after year after year after year after year, time's up. But Joseph said, that's not me. I'm not God. He is. And so I hope you'll spend some time with my having just maybe planted a few seeds, wrestle with that question yourself. Am I in the place of God? And what are the implications of that for you? Maybe you need to let go of some things in life that you've been holding on to. Maybe there's some things been standing between you and God that's separated you from Him. The Bible calls that sin, and if we are involved in sin and we know it, we need to repent of that sin and give it to God and change the direction of our lives because we're not God. We are His creatures. I hope you'll think about that question and wrestle with it some. Second question comes from Matthew chapter 16. It's a question that Jesus himself asked. Jesus had left heaven according to Philippians chapter 2 beginning in verse 5. He had emptied himself. He had poured himself out. It is as though he took his, his heavenly deity and poured it out like we would pour water out of a pitcher. He emptied himself of that 
when he left heaven and came to this earth. And he did so knowing that eventually his earthly life would end as a result of the crucifixion of Jesus, of his own crucifixion. And so there was one occasion when Jesus was involved with, in a discussion with his disciples. It's recorded for us in Matthew chapter 16. If you look beginning in about verse 10 of, of, that's, pardon me, I was in 15. If you look beginning in verse 12 of Matthew 16, then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Jesus had just said, beware of the Sadducees. Some of them looked around and said, oh my goodness, he's hungry. We need some bread. Did you happen to bring bread? And, did you? and Jesus, I like sometimes to envision what might be the humor of situations. In my mind, I can see Jesus going, oh, you still don't have it. I'm not talking about bread. And finally, he talked to them some more, and they understood that he was talking about the leaven or doctrine of the Pharisees, false teaching. So then the very next verse says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? That's a powerful question itself, but we're going to move on to another one in a moment. But here are these followers of Jesus. They'd been working with him, following with him, taught by him, observed what all he was doing. And he looks at them and he says, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They didn't really have to think about it. They said, well, Lord, some say that you're John the Baptist. Well, they knew, Jesus knew that he was not John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the, his forerunner who came to prepare the way for him. And so some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say that you're Elijah. Elijah was a great Old Testament prophet. But Jesus was not Elijah. Others say you're Jeremiah, another great prophet in the Old Testament or one of the prophets. But then after engaging them in that discussion, it's almost like, in my mind, it's almost like he turned right toward them, zeroed right in on their eyes. His eyes met theirs, and then he asked, but who do you say that I am? What a question. You know, it's easy for us to say, regardless of what the subject is, it's easy for us to say, well, now, they think this, or this group over there does this, or can you believe he actually thinks this? It's easy for us to talk about what others think, what others believe, what others say. That is exactly the first question Jesus asked. What do, who do people say that I am? So they, they answered it very honestly. But then it was a laser focus between him and them. And it is as though he said, well, that's all fine and good. But what I really want to know is who do you say that I am? Peter often in Scripture is one of the first to speak. That's gotten him in trouble on a number of occasions. But in this response, he hit the nail on the head. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, Peter and these apostles were not perfect men. As we read through the scripture, even after this conversation, we can see time and time and time again when they did not make the best choice or when they messed up. But I truly believe, just based upon my study of Scripture, that it was their intent in life, at least from this point on, to live in view of the fact that He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Why would they have endured what they endured if they didn't believe that? Why would they have endured stonings, 
being left for dead, shipwrecked, false imprisonment. If they didn't believe with all of their heart and soul and mind that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, do you think they would have persisted and allowed men to, mis to treat them as though they were treating them? If I had not believed that, I don't think I would have endured that. And the fact that they endured it seems to me to be proof of the fact that they believed it with all of their heart. They didn't always do what he said. Sort of reminds me of the Old Testament King David. David made some really poor choices in life, but what did God say about him? He's a man after my own heart. And so I believe if we answer this question, who do you say that I am, as Peter answered that question on that occasion, it will make all the difference in the world in our lives. We will live for him. We will speak for him. We will share him with others. We will share the message of Jesus with anyone with whom we have an opportunity to share it because he's made all the difference in the world and in the world to come in our lives. I hope you'll spend some time wrestling with that question. You're here on a Sunday night. That says a lot about you. But who do you say Jesus is? Be really honest with yourself. Who is he and what difference has he made in my life? It's easy to answer a question correctly. Peter could have answered that question, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, and it would have been 100% correct. He could have said that even if he didn't believe a word of it. But if you believe it, what difference is he making in your life? One more question I want us to look at. This one comes from Acts chapter 2. These three questions, it seems to me, follow a natural progression. First of all, we, like Joseph, realize that we are not God, thus we are completely dependent upon Him for our salvation. Second, realizing that we are not God, we come to understand and believe who is and that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And since that is the case, what difference does it make? And to me, this question, what shall we do, is the question that tells us the difference that it makes. You're familiar with Acts chapter 2. It's a beautiful, beautiful chapter. The Lord had told the apostles before his ascension, now you go back to Jerusalem and you wait until you receive power from on high. And so they did. Jesus returned to heaven and so their, their master was gone. Their leader was gone. Here they are all by themselves. I suspect there was a lot of this what are we going to do now attitude going on among them? You know, he said we're to do this, but I mean, where do we start? He said, wait. So they're waiting. They're waiting in the city of Jerusalem. It's around the time of the uh, festival of Pentecost. So thousands of people had come to the city of Jerusalem. Do you suspect that's why Jesus wanted them to wait in Jerusalem? Of course it was. Because thousands of people from all over the world were there. And he told them, you wait until you receive power from on high. And so they were all assembled together in one room. They're probably scared. They're probably afraid. They know that the multitude who killed Jesus know that they're followers of Jesus. And so they're, they're, they're together in this room. And then all of a sudden, it seems like the weirdest things ever began to happen. It sounds like a great tornado coming through the room, but when they look around, there's no evidence that the wind is blowing. And, and then all of a sudden, they look at one another, and little flames of fire hovering above their heads. 
And then they started speaking to one another in languages that they'd never known before. And I suspect that it's probably the first time that it all really clicked for those apostles. Okay, this is what he meant. This is what that for which we were to wait. Power from on high. Okay, it all makes sense now. So what happens? Peter gets up and starts preaching. I think the text will bear out that all of them did, but Peter's sermon is the one that's revealed for us. And the first thing he does when he gets the people's attention, he dispels a rumor that had gone around that these guys who were speaking in other languages were drunk. He, in essence, said, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. It's just 9 o'clock in the morning. Of course we're not drunk. Wouldn't it be nice if that argument still was effective today? It was effective then. And then he began preaching. He said, this Jesus. And when they, he said the word Jesus, I suspect that multitude began trembling because had they, I think it's possible some of those people were there when Jesus was crucified. I think it's possible they were among them were some who had yelled, crucify him, crucify him. And even if they had not been there, they had heard about that crucifixion. So when Peter said, Jesus, uh-oh, whom you crucified is both Lord and Christ. And all of a sudden, they realize we kill the Messiah, the one for whom we've been waiting. We killed him. And the Bible says in verse 37, when they heard that, in other words, when they realized the implications of what he said, when they heard that, they were cut to the heart. It was like the word of God just laid bare their hearts. And they became fully consumed with their guilt. And they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we Is there anything we can do? We kill the Son of God. Just tell us what. Is there anything we can do? The implications of that question are, we've killed God's Son. We're lost. We have no hope. We're going to spend eternity separated from God. What shall we do? And Peter, being empowered by that Holy Spirit that God had promised, said, there's nothing you can do. You're all going straight to hell forever. That's what they deserved. That's what I deserve. That's what you deserve. Because we've, we weren't there physically nailing the spikes into his flesh. But we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And it was our sin, just as it was theirs, that nailed him to that cross. So what should we do? What Peter actually said was, let every one of you repent. Change the direction of your life completely. Stop going where you were going. Stop doing what you were doing and go in a completely different direction. Go toward the king. Go toward Jesus. They were already consumed with sorrow. The Bible tells us that godly sorrow leads to repentance. They were consumed with sorrow. That's what led to the question, what shall we do? Let every one of you repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. You mean that's, that's all we have to do? It's no question they believed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. They just heard Peter convince them of that, and there's no question they believed that they were guilty of killing him. 
So they, in their sorrow, repented of their sins, and the Bible tells us that that day there were some 3,000 souls baptized into Christ. And that that evangelistic uh, campaign continued, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Three awesome questions. Am I in the place of God? Who do you say that I am? What shall we do? I don't know of any way to conclude a lesson on questions other than with this one. What will your answer be? We saw what their answer was. They obeyed Jesus. They did not hesitate for a second. They obeyed Jesus. That day they were baptized into Christ. That day they were forgiven of their sins. That day... And so now we're going to ask one another this very same question. What will your answer be? Let's stand and encourage one another.